sir. Time is up to you. Thank you. Greetings to all, and thank you, Benoit sir, for that uh, introduction. As we heard uh, that we looked into chapter sixteen, and we have come to the end of chapter sixteen, where we saw a uh, great judgment has fallen on the earth. And even to the point with what we read last was verse 21, uh, that great hailstones of hundreds of pounds fell on men, but they continued to curse God. From that, when we look into chapter 17, we see a change that is taking place uh, from that narration that we've been following so far. And we will just quickly look at that. In chapter 17, when we come, we see that chronologically, as we've been talking, the order is again put on hold. And as uh, even Benaisa referred, in 17 and 18, we, we look back to um, the Babylon and the fall of Babylon. As <clears throat> just now it was mentioned in verse 19 of chapter 16, we read that last time, the great split uh, city split in three parts and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of wrath. That is what we had looked at last week and we had seen how the final aspects of God's judgment falls on the earth. But that was much ahead of where we, when we look at chapter 17, it starts. And when we look into chapter 17, we read and we understand about the fall of Babylon the Great. We will go into details of that. What we need to understand is there has been a constant battle since the time Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. From that time, sin entered into the world. Satan had his dominion over man and man is in bondage, is by nature a sinner. Since uh, sin is natural to him, rebellion is natural to him, and doing everything that is against God and following after what is sinful and controlled by the devil is what uh, man has been. Uh, Godsey, could you read Romans chapter 1 and verse 21? All of Romans chapter 1, in fact, the beginning uh, few chapters of the epistle to the Romans is all directed towards the sinfulness of man. I think we all are aware of it. But Romans chapter 1 and verse 21. Um, that when they know, knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Yeah, though they knew God, you see, God, as we read in the, uh, in the creation uh, narration in Genesis chapter 1, that God conferred within himself, within the Trinity, and said, let us make man in our own image. And we also re read in Genesis chapter 1 that God formed man from the dust of the earth and breathed into man the breath of life. God imparted to man an element, an aspect of himself. And thus we read in Genesis chapter 1 that man became a living soul. That is what differentiates us from all of other creation of God. You see, we look around this world and we see such beautiful, amazing creation. Very colorful, very strong, very vibrant, uh, more powerful than us, have more adaptability than us. Mankind, when you compare to the other creatures of this world, are uh, not well suited for this world. If you take a polar bear living in, in, the, in the polar ice caps, it has a thick fur, it has thick uh, layer of fat, it has the ability, it's, a, it's the world's fiercest hunter, it has the ability to hunt. When a man stands against a polar bear, we won't survive. Take a lion in the Saharas. The lion is a powerful beast, its jaws are meant, it's got uh, sharp teeth, its claws are huge, and it's meant to attack its prey and kill. Man standing alone against a lion will not survive. Then what is so special about man? Look at the birds of the air. They fly and they soar in the skies. 
there are birds that migrate for 1,500 kilometers uh, from north to south in the cold, and then in summer they migrate back. They can they can travel these distances without GPS. They can travel these distances without um, the need of um, any mechanical uh, instruments. Look at the fish of the sea. The salmon, they, they swim upstream against the current to reach uh, the spawning point. Nobody has to tell them where to go. Compare that to man. Man is so frail. And yet what is so special about man that man dominates all of them is the aspect that God put a part of himself in man and man became a living soul. Man has that element of God within him, has that part of man which is eternal. A human being may die, but the soul and the spirit does not die. The body dies. The body goes back to dust. When a dog dies or a lion dies or a polar bear dies or any, any other animal or living being dies, it becomes part of the earth. It does not have a living soul. But man is so different because man has God's part in him and so he is a living soul, eternal, immortal from that aspect. Of course, mortal because we, we sinned. But in this sinful world, we are mortal. But God, that was not God's intent. God's intent was to have an everlasting fellowship with us, was to have an everlasting fellowship with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and for them to continue to procreate, continue to bring uh, more human beings into this world to fill the earth. That was a command that God gave them. But man sinned. Man rebelled against God. Man accepted the enemy, the devil's, power over them and satanic influence has been on man since that time and when we read Romans chapter uh, in, in the book of Romans we understand that Paul establishes it very clearly and so here in verse 21 it says though they knew God every human being in himself how much ever he may say that I am an atheist and I don't believe in the existence of God in himself there is a search to find the answer of who am I why am I here what is my purpose? Who made me? How did I come into being? Those questions are there. And God has given us a conscience. God has given us an inner man that tries to lead us towards God. But look at that. They ne neither glorified God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their few foolish hearts were darkened. They sought to worship God, but rather than finding their dependence on God, they, they went to other so-called religions. They went to other uh, forms of worship, worshipping the things of this world, worshipping rocks and stones and uh, the skies and the celestial bodies, but not worshipping the living God. This was satanic influence. In them. When we come to chapter 17, we see the fall of the world religions, fall of every religion that does not glorify God, but especially in the end times, these religions will come together to form a world religion. And in chapter 17, Babylon represents that world religion and the fall of that world religion. It, the, all of this is spawned by the devil, by the enemy, and it is brought to complete destruction by the time we come to the end of chapter 17. So before we go into it, God say, could you read the key verse in uh, this chapter, Revelation chapter 17 and verse 17. For God had put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast and all the words of God shall be fulfilled. Look at that. How wonderful it is that we have a promise as we and, and, and a hope, even as we read through Revelation 17 and find that everything wrong is happening there, that there is a comfort to us that until the words of God are fulfilled. Today, look at us. 
look around us we live in a new age uh, ideology we live in a time of new philosophies there are so many thoughts that are around there are so many discussions around there are so many uh, you open facebook or youtube there are so many discussions even against the bible against the deity of christ against the very aspect of the exclusivity of jesus christ and the exclusivity of christian religion what do i mean by exclusivity we are one of the only religions that uh, or faiths i wouldn't say religion a faith who contends that there, there is only one way to salvation and that is through jesus christ when many other faiths say yeah we are one of the ways there was a saying in rome that all roads lead to rome the success of the roman empire was that wherever they conquered whichever nation they conquered they would build a highway to that nation so that trade could happen and so from rome there were to every empire they conquered every city they conquered you could access by by road and so there was a saying that all ro- roads lead to rome and similarly in the world view of religion today unless you are very fanatic about your your own faith it is said that all religions lead lead to god okay you're worshiping your god i am worshiping my god and my concept of god is different from your concept of god but at the end it is all one god but as christians as believers as dependent those who are dependent on the word of god we are clearly instructed there is only one way to heaven and that is through christ jesus and believe in him that is what is the exclusivity of our faith we cannot accept and the bible does not allow us to accept it is not us we are unwilling to accept but rather the god of the bible and the words of him saying that there is only one way to reach him and that is through jesus christ and this is a hard saying but it is a reality and this is what uh, we are taught and but but the world but the world does not see it that way romans chapter 1 let's go back to romans chapter 1 and when you read from verse um uh, verse 28 onwards romans chapter 1 and re- uh, read verse 28 okay we don't need to read everything i'll just read a few verses within that in verse 28 it reads in the middle portion god gave them over to a reprobate mind or in other words that he gave them over to a depraved mind that is what we see today depravity human depravity depravity means the 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 inability of human mind to understand god without the ability of God, the holy spirit god the spirit revealing him to us and so man in his depravity in that inability to find god on his own they are filled with look at verse 29 they are filled with every kind of wickedness evil greed they are full of envy murder strife and so on and so forth they invent ways of doing evil apostle paul wrote this almost 2000 years ago but when we look today around us isn't that so true there's so much of evil around us man is trying to find new and new ways to do evil whether it is in in terms of gluttony whether it is in terms of greed whether it is in terms of even uh, worship or anything they are finding ways to do things look at their nature they are gossips they are slanderers god haters insolent arrogant and boastful nature that we see around us isn't it human nature is so terrible it says that in verse 31 they are senseless faithless heartless ruthless verse 32 although they know god's righteous decree that those who does do such things deserve death they not only continue to do these very things but also approve of those who practice them that approval is what we see around us when when we try to share the gospel there is so much of resistance 
look around the world which is the one religion one faith that is persecuted the most take any country it is christianity there is a christian faith because satan knows that all other religions all other world religions are a fabrication of his own but there is only one faith today it's become a religion because again there satan has polluted it and brought in so much of wrong doctrine and created divisions and uh, denominations and made it a religion but the true faith true christian faith that true partnership that true fellowship with god is targeted the bible is targeted to be destroyed has always been targeted to be destroyed right from the the first century ad but it has survived because it is the word of god during the dark ages the papal rulers the the popes tried to suppress this uh, word the word of god they kept it in its original language they refused to have it translated they refused for the common man to read it and they brought out their own versions of traditions and practices and 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 that is why in in, in christendom that is called the dark ages till around 500 years ago god raised reformers who who came and uh, the printing press was created and they and it was brought into light again the word of god was suddenly available in the common man's language and freely available people like william tindale and others had to pay a, a great price their own life so that they could translate the bible into english or many others into various languages william carey came to india and he translated it is said about 30 languages in india he translated the bible or he was the reason that the bible was translated into so many languages they all paid the price could the bible be destroyed no satan tried and we have seen in revelation chapter 12 the dragon tries to destroy god's plan but god's plan prevails but you see here god has allowed the 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 evil to continue so that there would be a time at the end when he judges it completely we saw that judgment in revelation chapter 17 so in in the key verse we read that until the words of god are fulfilled god allows certain things uh, you know these days uh, there is i i whenever i post any uh, christian message there is a very close friend of mine we were very close uh in in when i was doing my masters and he will every time i put a christian message he will always target it and he will have his philosophical dialogues in it i don't go too much to discuss each time i just give him an answer when he keeps responding then i i leave that point but the next time i post something he will again put a response why and i always i feel so sad he's such a wonderful person but i feel sad because god needs to enlighten his heart without the, it's such a reminder to us that we know him today only because of the holy spirit and the holy spirit opening our eyes of our bl- that our blind eyes to see the truth putting that faith that saving faith in us into us so that we could believe otherwise we were just like them and so i keep having these discussions but he keeps bringing in human ideology and philosophical thought and even uh, talking very negative about uh, faith but we continue and we trust and so satan has blinded the, the the minds of people and so when we come to chapter 17 the the whole focus there is about world religions and the 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 destruction of that world religion so coming back into a chronological order we see that chapter 17 is the vision of human government and world religion it's kind of interwoven together world religion is the focus there but it is riding on human government this has been historically the fact it is a reality today look at most countries around the world it is religion that controls and dictates the governments and the direction that the governments need to go wars have been fought over religion 
including Christianity. The Holy Crusades was the darkest, most negative, and, uh, and what brought the name of Christ down, where in the name of Christ, in the name of Christianity, the Europeans came and destroyed and invaded uh, the Middle East areas. In the name of Christ, to, uh, to, to, to liberate the, the land of Israel. God never wants us to fight for him. God never wants us to shed blood for him. On the other hand, he taught us to, when we are slapped on one cheek, to show the other cheek. The, the popes controlled the European countries and so much of the negativism that, is, that, that has come up, so much of bloodshed, so much of plundering in the name of the church was done during the papal times in those dark ages that I mentioned. So world uh, governments have been controlled by uh, religion. And we see here in chapter 17 that that thread continues even till the end. And so chapter 17 is, is a look from way back before tribulation. So it is way back before even uh, what we were looking at in chapter 16, where the, we saw the judgments. And it moves up to the point of what we saw in chapter 14 and, and again to chapter 19. So 16, uh, sorry, 17 and 18 are chronologically taking us to different times, but bringing us, showing us different scenes, building the, uh, the whole background so we would understand so that by the time we come to chapter 19, we are very clear of what is happening. And I, I've said this before, I will say it again. It is because of this chronological back and forth that many find the study of the book of Revelation very hard. Because you, we just read in chapter 16, uh, there was huge hailstone and, uh, and there was uh, the, the, the earthquake had split these cities and Babylon was destroyed. And then suddenly you read 17 and Babylon and uh, this mystery Babylon and you get all confused. Because we try to read it chronological sequence without understanding that now 17 has taken us to a different scene and, and that if we need to continue reading what happened after 16, we re what happens after 16, we really need to skip two chapters and go to 19 and then we understand, oh, that is what it is. So 16 and 17 is giving us a different view. Uh, as I mentioned earlier also, is it's like when you watch these movies, when the movie that they, they show a certain storyline and then they stop and then say, meanwhile, this is what is happening. Or if you read a book, the author will give us a storyline of what is happening. Let's say, for example, in London, this was happening. And it says, oh, meanwhile, in Delhi, this is happening. And in New York, this is happening. And then it all culminates together and the storyline moves. So the book of Revelation is like that. We need to understand these are scenes that are happening at different time periods, at different locations. And, and uh, it, it could be some of them from heaven. It could be some that are directed at God's people, uh, the people of Israel. So it, it all varies. So we need to understand this. So let us come to chapter 17. And God see, could you read verse 1? Hello. God say, leave Edu when a winger thunder lightning. Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. Jaren, could you read, please? Thank you, thank you, Ma. Jaren, could you read uh, 17 verse 1? Yes. The one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Chapter 17 starts by saying, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls. You remember that? So it relates us back to 16. Um, and so j just imagine from John's perspective, he's watching this whole scene of the seven bowls and the judgment that is happening. Then one of the angels comes and calls him, wait, wait, now come. I will take you to a different scene and I will take you to show you something. Okay, so we have to pictureize this in our mind of what is happening. One is trying to understand God's revelation, but also to understand the scenarios and the scenes and put ourselves in John's shoes to understand more of this. So 
he was watching all of the judgment and he's imagined. So he's awestruck at the scene that he's just seen of the destruction of the earth with those great hailstones. So, and, and remember, these are all visions that he's seeing. It's not actually happening. And, and then suddenly, as, as he's looking at that, here comes one of those angels who had the bowl. Now, which one? Is it angel one, angel two, angel seven? We don't know. But one of those angels comes and says, hey, John, come. Let me show you something. And he says, come, I will show you the judgment. So here is another judgment being shown. So remember what I said, 16 was the final judgment of the earth. But here now, John is told, I will show you another judgment, a judgment of a great harlot who sits on many waters. Before we go into the details of that, uh, can we also read Revelation chapter 21? And uh, verse 9, it's on the screen also, uh, chapter 21 and verse 9. We see that then, seven, one of the seven angels coming there too. Then one of the seven angels who had seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Ah, so there are two times that John is being told by one of the seven angels to come, I will show you. I will show you, in one case, a great harlot uh, who is sitting on many waters and her judgment. And in this case, in chapter 21, it says that, come, I will show you the lamb's wife. I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. How different are these two invitations? One is to come and see the judgment that is going to take place against a woman who is seated on many waters, who is called a harlot, a prostitute, one who has had relationships with others with whom she's not supposed to. And here in 21 is an invitation to come to see the bride, the pure, the, the one who has not had a relationship, who has kept herself pure, for the one who she was espoused to, the lamb's wife. Why the lamb's wife by then there? It's because in, in 19, the marriage of the lamb has already taken place. And of course, when we go and read uh, chapter 21, we understand that that is the new Jerusalem, which is in all its beauty coming from heaven to the earth before, the, before it is set up for the millennial rule. So we see two different invitations that John gets. But at this point, we are going to look at that invitation, which is specifically towards the uh, seeing the harlot. And in verse three, it says, so he carried me away in spirit into the wilderness. So now where is John? John is in some desert, in some uh, wilderness. The scene that is before him now is going to be played out in some sort of a wilderness. So it is not in heaven. It is not on the sea. It is not on the earth in some lush uh, green garden but rather in a desert in a wilderness where nothing grows where there is nothing good there and it is in this wilderness that in this desert that he is being shown this great scene and what is that scene it is a great harlot a prostitute who is sitting on uh, on a scarlet beast with which has many names on it who has seven heads and ten horns. We have seen elements of this earlier, so I will not refer too much to it. But if you if you remember in Daniel, we've looked at it, and also in in Revelation, we have looked at it. Uh, we've looked at the beast in chapter twelve. We've looked at the beast of chapter thirteen, and so here we see added to the beast and those ten, seven horns and ten uh, seven heads and ten horns is now a prostitute who is sitting on the beast. Satan's empire of those seven years is an empire that is military-based, that is powerful militarily, uh, it is mighty. It is a base, it is a kingdom of Satan that encompasses all the world. All, almost all of the countries have joined into this alliance. It is a, it is a mighty uh, empire. It is an empire of a confederation of 10 kingdoms but then 10 nations, but then also of other nations who have joined it. But at the same time, during the tribulation period, 
it is also a mystical um, empire because Satan by then has unified all of the worship, all of uh, religions together into a one world religion. As I mentioned earlier, the ideology of, yeah, all roads lead to Rome. You have your faith. I have my faith. I don't have any faith. I don't believe in God. It is all acceptable. It is all leading, to, leading towards one. But at the end of it, it is also worship towards the beast. And we saw that also, that the worship will be towards that antichrist, the beast, and the image of the beast that is put up in, in, in the temple of God. So in this chapter, Babylon represents the, the, that, that uh, one world religion. It represents any form of religion that is against God, against uh, Christ, and against the, the, the gospel that is being preached. And it is, it is a religion which is completely given towards idolatry and it is given towards uh, being everything that is controlled by the devil. The, if we continue reading the, the next few verses, it says that this woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and was adorned um, with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. Such terrible things. We will go into the details of that. But before we do, I want to focus on verse 5, first of all, because there we get the identity of this woman. And on her forehead, a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. So here it is that what, what she represents is everything that is to do with abominations. Abominations means everything that is to do with things against God. Uh, we, we had seen this earlier in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 18. A prediction had already gone. Remember, there were three angels, one that flew and proclaimed the everlasting gospel, one uh, that flew and talked about uh, the judgment that is coming. And, and, and that angel said, fallen, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. So we are already in chapter 14 and chapter 16, uh, we, are, we, are, we are made to understand that Babylon, the city is fallen and Babylon represents everything that is against God. But in this chapter, also fallen Babylon, but it is related to world religion. So let us for a minute talk about uh, this verse and for us to understand a little bit more about it. It says, mystery her names that are written on her forehead, she has a name, Mystery. She has a name, Babylon the Great. She has a name, the Mother of Harlots. And she has a name, the Abomination of the Earth. Each has its own significance. She is a mystery because there is a lot of mysticism that is, that is brought in. Satanic mysticism means um, that everything that is related to evil and magic and uh, demonic worship and superstition. You know, look around us. Every religion that is around us has so much of superstition, so much of mysticism. The practice of the occult, the practices of demonic incantations, the practice of, of speaking to the dead or, or raising the spirits or all of this is satanic. It is led by the enemy, the devil. You study any religion of this world and you will find elements of mysticism in it, of the practices of the occult. The extreme ends are things like voodoo or uh, African uh, animalistic faiths. But uh, if you look at the Chinese, if you look at the Indian, if you look at um, the Western, Eastern, they, they, they are all seeped in mysticism. Look at the way the idols are formed today. They're all demonic. They are influenced by Satan and influenced by his demons. And that is what people worship. 
the extreme end of that is where people say today i am god i am a god too and and even the the acceptance of there is no absolute truth my what i say is truth also all of this comes out of that satanic influence that is in us and where we want to remove god from his throne and put anything else in place of god so mystery babylon the great and we will come to that a little while is that the the genesis of all of this happened and started in that city of babel and we will we will talk about that uh, a little bit more later but before we go into it and i want to put a, a very familiar verse to us in exodus chapter 20 we we know this when god gave the commandments the 10 commandments do you remember the first two commands you shall have no other god other before me and uh, the second commandment was you shall not make yourself a carved image look at around us isn't that what is happening they want to create any other god than god the living god once i was talking to a friend of mine uh, uh, her husband is a devout hindu and uh, i was asking i was talking to him actually and i was saying do you really believe that then we were in his in their house and they had these uh, puja room and they had all these idols and i said do you really believe that your god is like that and your god is here that you're praying to these idols you know so now they've understood that that you know in the, in the, in the olden days i think they they believed that this was god now they are being indoctrinated by saying no 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 this is only and so his answer to me is no this is only so that we can look at something and then pray to the god who is uh, without form no so they're trying to bring logic into why they have but if you look into the roots of these idols with i don't know 10 hands and five heads or a uh, head of a uh, uh, an elephant and whatever it is they are all demonic tongue hanging out eyes bulging out you know look at baal and ashurath and all those other uh, even biblical times Uh, idols that were there they are all demonic they have come from demons god knew even for the children of israel this would be very hard have you ever thought of why god sent and chose canaan and god sent god's people uh, the people of israel to canaan and to destroy that land and overtake it and to populate there it was a punishment for god's people for the people of israel it was a reward it was a blessing to, to be given this land but for the people of canaan it was a punishment because idolatry and witchcraft and satanic worship had gone to its extreme end in the land of canaan that god sent the people of israel there to cleanse the land and to put up a testimony for him there they were to tabernacle in the promised land and become an example to the people around of how true worshipers of god worship god and so before they went there he gave them the commandments and he said you shall have no other god before me but the lord your god you shall not make any graven image but what did they do first of all they did not fulfill his commandment of destroying all the people of that land they kept a few which ended up as a thorn in their flesh and secondly they intermarried and we know that from the story of balaam how balaam uh, told balak the when he couldn't curse them he gave he told them that all oh, all you have to do is to you know they they are a separated people break their separation god will be angry with them and so he told him the idea of send your women so that they would intermarry which which brought sin in, in, in among them idolatry came in among them and so it is when god looks at his people in jeremiah chapter 3 the the lord says that look at my people in the days of josiah the king josiah was one of the last good kings in fact he was the last good king he was one of the last kings of uh, judah it is about um, a few years before 
the, uh, the king nebuchadnezzar came and took captive the, the the kingdom of judah and look what he says about it uh, jeremiah with uh, the prophecy look what he says to the people of god he says have you seen what backsliding israel have done she has gone up on every high mountain and every green tree and there played the harlot she has prostituted herself god is a holy god god is a jealous god god is one for whom he demands purity he demands faithfulness he demands that god's people be faithful to him and him alone it is an exclusive religion you know recently i was seeing a video and where the, this person was saying that oh you know the world religions are all like this water bottle okay i can take this water bottle i can drink water from it i can take another water bottle and drink from it one water bottle uh, that he showed had a yellow ribbon on it it says but this is what christianity says that only this water bottle is true religion because only that will give you the right water but every other bottle has water but that is such a flawed thinking it is not the packaging we are not talking about packaging we are not talking about just a yellow ribbon that is tied around one bottle that that makes it a difference but rather we are talking of the fact of god wanting to have a relationship with us and that is possible only through jesus christ and his death on the cross of calvary and his blood that was shed for us as children of god even to us if we are not faithful to god if our focus is not god then god looks at us as those who have prostituted themselves because we are to keep ourselves holy we are the bride of christ and we are to keep ourselves holy when we remain unholy we have prostituted ourselves we are like prostitutes who have gone and are lying down with any man that is around that is what he says about israel in verse 8 again it says israel has committed adultery he's talking about a nation how can a nation commit adultery it means that they have gone and accepted the practices and the faiths and they have compromised in what was supposed to be their by be god's original intent to be the people of god and to be a witness to those around of god and his glory the shekena glory which came down and tabernacled with them they were to promote it and they were to portray that to all the land and people around but what did they do and we see king solomon when he became king the wisest man on the earth as god himself testifies and yet he was so foolish that he went and married uh, pharaoh's daughter uh, and and from there brought sin and brought idolatry and and thus his life was destroyed and his generations were destroyed how sad it is in verse 9 it says she she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees israel was busy building and erecting asherah poles and is uh, building baal uh, temples and baal idol uh, baal idols how terrible it is where god told them to keep their separation where god told them that this is Uh, you are a separated people and he told them it is i have been selected you because you were a large number or you because there was anything special in you but because i chose you but you have gone away in in isaiah he says that i found you on the road side you were bloody i took you i cleaned you i i put ornaments on you and and you know he talks about the city of jerusalem but you have gone ahead and prostituted yourself how terrible it is let us for a moment look at ourselves if that is what god did for the people of israel for us god sent his beloved son to die on the cross for our salvation to pay the price of our sins the son of god died on the cross of calvary are we prostituting ourselves are we adulterous have we gone away from god and from his purposes in our lives let us examine ourselves in exodus chapter in ezekiel chapter 30 and verse 
God tells of Israel that how degenerate is your heart. You're doing the deeds of a brazen harlot. What is the state of our heart? Once the love of Christ came into our lives and cleansed us and saved us and made us, that sin that is in us was removed and we were cleansed and made us white in his presence. Has sin come back into our lives? Have we allowed the devil to have dominion over us? Let us remember that the things of this world are perishing. It is all destined towards destruction. There is no point conserving this earth because, now I'm not saying that we should go ahead and just spend and destroy the earth, but everything on this earth is destined towards destruction. To be judged by flaming fire, to be burned up. So if we are thinking of saving things and preparing for tomorrow and uh, making loads of money or gold or whatever it is, or lands or anything, let us remember, all of this will perish. One day we will stand at the judgment seat of Christ and we will be judged for the works that we have done. Ephesians 2 verse 10 says that we have been called to good works. We have been saved to do good works. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it says that we, are, we will stand at the judgment seat of Christ. Our works will be judged and everything that is wood, stubble or hay, everything that was done that is not pleasing to God will be burnt up. Let us focus on our works and our lives to be those of gold, uh, silver and precious stones which will go through that fire of judgment and come out blazing and come out in a, in a manner that would glorify God and that would be rewarding. Let us remember that everything is coming towards eternal destruction. Isaiah chapter 47 and verse 5 it says, O daughter of the Chaldeans, the Chaldean is another word for the, the Babylonian time, the Babylonian empire. It says, for you no longer shall be the lady of the kingdoms. You see this woman representing the world religions, the Babylonian time, uh, uh, what is known as a great um, uh, harlot, the great Babylon, she is destined towards destruction. Let us remember that. Let us keep ourselves holy and let us praise God. God has given us a time that we will be saved from that period. When we, when we, if you remember, when we studied Revelation chapter 13 and when we talked about the two beasts, the first beast that comes out of the sea, uh, the Antichrist, and the second beast that comes out of the seas, out of the waters, uh, sorry, out of the earth, and that known as a false prophet, we read in verse 12 that he causeth the earth and all of them who dwell therein to worship the first beast. It is a reminder to us and it is a clear indication that by the time of that final uh, judgment of the great tribulation period, the, the religions would all be undermined and a strong unified world religion would come into place, which would be the worship of the first beast. That is what the impact of Babylon would be. But to understand what Babylon is, we have to go to Gen Genesis chapter 11 and uh, reading from verse 1, we see the, the, the beginning of this uh, rebellion to God through religion. Genesis chapter 11, and I think it's a very familiar portion to us. We won't read all of it, but there it says that uh, this is after the flood. And this is after the world has been repopulated again by the generations of Noah and his sons. And there they come up with a plan and they say in verse 3, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly, you know, and, and come together. In verse 4, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered on the face of the earth. Have you ever wondered 
why God was against this? What was so wrong about it? The people were saying, come, we will all live together. We will make a nice, great city. We will build a tower, a very tall tower. Of course, they cannot reach God, but they said we will build a tower that reaches up to God and we will dwell here. In verse 8, it says, the Lord scattered them. Why do you think that this was so wrong? The objective of that was that they wanted to come together and they were building what this structure that they were building is called a ziggurat. And a ziggurat was a place of worship and it was a place where they worshipped. They would put the zodiac signs. They would have priests and they would worship, not God, but celestial bodies. They would call Jupiter God. They would call Saturn God. They would call the moon God. And they would worship. It was pure rebellion. Rebellion against God. It was at the heart of it was Satan-led rebellion against God. Just remember. Well, it was only a few years ago that God had destroyed all rebellion. And we read that Noah found favor in the sight of God. And God uh, rescued Noah, that righteous man, who was blameless before God. And his family and everyone else perished. Only Noah and his three sons and their wives were saved. A righteous family. When they came out of the ark, we read that the first thing Noah did was build an, uh, build a, an altar and worship God. But look how in a span of a few years, from the generation of this righteous man, people have already rebelled against God. We read that God repented that he created man and that is why he destroyed them with a flood. But now he's promised he will not destroy them anymore with, with waters. And so God brings a confusion of language because they all spoke the same language and they all were gathered together. He brought a confusion of language and he split them. And there it is that that place in verse 9 is called Babel. Babel stands for confusion. God created that confusion of languages so that at least they would split and they would go different ways and they would not all come together and every one of them would not be satanic controlled. And so that is what Babel is. But when you come to chapter 10, and one interesting aspect that you can read is when we read in chapter 10, uh, that in verse 6, the sons of Ham, Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. Okay. Now notice that son, Ham's son's name was Cush. Look at verse 8. Cush was the father of Nimrod, who grew to be a mighty warrior on the earth. And he built Babylon. In verse 10, the first centers of his kingdom were Babylon. So Babylon is not an old city. It's not a new city. It's an old city. It is from the time of the rebellion of people against God. In, in, uh, when, when Noah came back, God told him, God blessed him and said, Noah be and his sons, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Fill the earth. That was a commandment. But what did they want to do? They wanted to all come together and stay in one place and build a tower and rebel against God. It was the same command that God gave to Adam and Eve in Genesis 1.28. He said, the Lord blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. But what do they want to do? As we saw, just three, the grandson of Cush or the great grandson of Noah, Nimrod, wants to build a city and wants to uh, and 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 call and and come there and worship God. Rebellion, rebellion against God. That is what we see right from there. And even today, it continues. Coming back to Revelation, and uh, we will end today's class here. We see it is a one-world religion. Do you know there is a one-world religion headquarters? That picture is today. It is now. 
last year a one religion one world religion headquarters was opened in abu dhabi it has three buildings one for the muslim faith one for the christian faith and one for the jewish faith the three religions that ascribe and say there is only one god we are coming to the end times let us understand this and let us be careful that as we approach these end times to understand that the harlot is already ready she is in our midst she is already polluting our minds and philosophies and bringing in aspects that are preparing for the coming of the evil one of the enemy the antichrist but as we see this let us also keep ourselves pure and holy for him and let us make sure that we live lives that are ready and prepared for the coming of our lord jesus christ may his name be glorified